first base, oh, right yeah. by the dug, right by the dug. First base, oh, right yeah. by the dug, right by the dug. my pal here you can hear him we're babysitting a dog you're gonna let him vote mike I'm gonna let him vote why not good evening this uh, i'd like to call to order the board of selectmen meeting for july 8th at 6 p.m uh i will um Good evening, everyone. This is a virtual Board of Selectmen meeting. We are using the Zoom uh, conferencing format. The webinar ID is 942-5089-5994. Uh, I will take a roll call uh, for attendance. Alan? Aye. 
And Pat? Aye. And Ed? Here. And Mike? I'm here. And Jill is here, okay? And this is the public forum. This is, oh, excuse me, approve the June 24th and June 30th select new meeting minutes. So moved. Second. And were, were we all uh, here? Not yeah. on the 30th. That's the one we conducted for my lobster boat. Oh, right. And I wasn't here. So we'll have to do it separately. So let's do June 24th. So moved. Second. Okay, all um, uh, Pat? Aye. And Ed? Aye. Mike? Aye. Alan? Aye. And Sheila says aye. And now for June 30th, I was not present. So, um, Ed? Aye. And uh, Mike? I was late, so I didn't get to vote. Okay, I Alan? Was there. But you did right. sign the warrants, thank you. I did sign the warrant, yeah. And Alan? Aye. And I was not here, so uh, meeting is approved. Okay, public forum. This is an opportunity for anyone who wants to address the Board of Selectmen with any issue that is not on the agenda. Do we see any hands? All right, moving on. Uh, item four, now that Becky Nillette is the appointed assessor, she will sign on the tax commitment paperwork, but we are asking the Board of Selectmen to set the proposed tax rate. Fiscal year 21 tax rate was 945 with a total valuation of 2 billion, 11 million, 16,700. Um, and the proposed fiscal 22 budget estimate est is estimated at 941 or 46 increase or 492. And I, I'm really messing this up. Lori, do you want to take this? Sure, sure. And I'll let Jen come up um, to talk about it as well. So when we went to the proposed FY22 budget, we had estimated a potential of a tax rate of 991, which would have been a 46 cent increase or just under 5%. Um, the school tax commitment actually ended up coming lower, even though their budget was increased. The amount that they needed from the towns was uh, or from Kenny Bunkport I should say is lower than last year because they had a large amount of carry forward funds um, from FY21 that they'll be carrying forward to FY22. The county budget came in slightly higher than estimated so our total taxable value we normally estimate at one percent increase um, which would be about a $20 million increase. And it actually came in at 27 million or about a 1.38% increase. And um, because of the changes in those budgets, we know that the minimum tax rate we need is 951. Um, the maximum tax rate allowed by the state for us would be 999, which would be a $976,000 overlay. So staff is recommending a tax rate of $9.60, which equates to a 15 cent increase or 1.59%. And that would allow for a $168,000 overlay. Yeah, and I just wanna mention that, that I think that's very good seeing as last year we kept the, the uh, tax rate even um, because of the COVID situation. So 15 cents, I think that's really pretty good. Yeah, I'm all about it. It's okay with me. I think it's yeah. fair. Yeah. Okay. So do we I have a motion? motion? I make a motion we set the uh, tax rate at 960. Uh, Second. All right, and let's take a vote. Pat? Aye. Ed? 
It just disappeared. Okay. Well, maybe he'll come in at the end. Uh, Mike? Aye. Alan? Aye. And, I, and Sheila says aye. Do you want to wait a minute? Well, I think we've got four. Are we good? You've got four. Motion to good. Thank you. Okay. And five, annual board committee appointments. Do you want me to read each name? Lori? I think if you guys would want to, so we have reappointments and new appointments. And so Tracy has put in your packet um, a uh, two pages, which are the reappointments, and then another page, which is new appointments. So I would suggest that you um, take them separately as motions and that you can read them off um, for every uh, committee, and then if you guys want to move that slate with those terms as specified. All right, so we'll start with the administrative code. Uh, Richard Smith reappointed, uh, new term expires 22. April Dufault, new term expires 22. And Michael Weston, new term exposed, uh, expires 22. So do, we, do you want to vote on them individually like that? Or just one whole page? It's up to you. You guys can do it either way. Why don't we do it? Why don't we go down through them all? And then I would suggest, and then do it once. Very good. Okay, going on to the budget board, Alan Evelyn. Okay, so we don't, you guys don't vote on the budget board though because the um, moderator uh, appoints the budget board, but we just put that on your sheet, sorry, so that you do. We'll skip that one. K Porpoise Pier, Peter Eaton, fires 22. Benjamin Noonan, 22. Zandy Talmadge, 22. And Eric Wiles, 22. Cemetery Committee, Ruth Fernandes, 20. These are all 22. Ruth Fernandes, Linda Bryan, Greg Pargelis, and Sanders, Rita Schlegel. Grown, growth planning, these expire 24. Paul Hogan and Daniel Saunders. Government Wharf, expires all 22. Jeff Davis, Ron Francoeur, Thomas Man Mansfield, Chris Welsh, and Andrew Welsh. Penny Bunk River City, Richard Woodman, expires 24. Lighting Committee, Jewel Garish, expires 24, and the rest uh, will expire in 24, Planning Board, Tom Boak, Edward Francis, and Charles Larry uh, Simmons, and there's more. Public Safety Committee, expiring in 22, Jay Everett, Mike Claus, Craig Sanford, Joseph Carroll. Recreation Committee, expiring in 22, Robert Conbury, Kristen Garvin, Adam Hartwig, and Susan Steiff. Shade Tree Committee, Sarah O'Sullivan, expires all the rest 22, Nina Perlmutter, and Stephen Powell. Shellfish Conservation Committee, term expires 24, Edward Jellison and John Crowther. Wastewater Advisory Committee, expiring in 22, Bob Convery, Joseph Mead, Margaret Myatt. And the ZBA board expiring in 24, Paul Cadigan, Kevin McDonald. Make a motion to approve the slate just written for 2021 committee board reappointment. Second. All right, take a vote. Um, Alan? Aye. And Pat? Aye. And Ed? Is Ed back? Ed is not back yet. He, he's okay. got some technical difficulties. Okay. Uh, Mike, did I mention you? Oh, aye. And Sheila says aye. So motion carries. And we will move on to the, uh, the new appointments. In the administrative code, we have two vacancies 
the Board of Assessment Review. We have one vacancy and one vacancy for the alternate. The Budget Board, we have Rick Wakeland, his term will expire in 24. Conservation Commission, expiring in 24. Stephen Henna, Robin Phillips, and Carol Morris. Recreation Committee, we have three vacancies. Shade Tree Committee, expiring in 22. Stephen Hanna and Tricia Concannon. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. All right. That's taking a vote. Pat? Aye. Ed is not here. Mike? Aye. Alan? Aye. And Sheila says aye. Motion carries. Okay. And the next one is the board committee appointments for the BOS. And do, I, do you want me to read through? I think it would be good. Yeah. All right. I'm just organizing my notes here. The committees, K Porpoise Pier Committee will be Ed Hutchins. Goose Rocks Beach Advisory Committee will be Ed Hutchins. Government Wharf, Alan Daggett. Graves Library, Mike Weston. Investment Committee, Pat Briggs, Alan Daggett. CHEMS, Patrick Briggs. Public Safety Committee, Pat Briggs. SMRPC, Mike Weston. Growth Planning Committee, Alan Daggett. Planning Board, Sheila Matthews Ball, Shade Tree Committee, and Zoning Board of Appeals, all for me. And that's it. I'll make a motion to appoint the selectmen representatives as outlined on the full slate for this coming year. And Pat. Aye. Uh, Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. And Sheila says aye. So motion carries. All right. Um, authorize MMA workers compensation safety and central resolve. Lori. Currently the town um, receives its workers comp insurance through the Maine Municipal Association workers comp pool. Um, and we have had years where our rates have been better than others, depending on our experience. Um, we established a safety committee a few years ago to uh, work on the culture of safety within um, our various departments and address issues as they came up. One of the items that I've asked um, Jay Everett as head of the safety committee and the safety committee to work on is this workers comp safety incentive program. As you can see in the packet, um, there are three tiers and the three tiers of the program allow you to address um, items that are basic to safety in terms of making sure that um, personnel are trained appropriately, that we're keeping good records, um, that we do inspections of our facilities. And uh, we have a back to work program. And many of these things we do have, we just haven't documented them in such a way. And if we are able to get to tier three, uh, which seems doable, we can get a 10% uh, annual savings on our premiums, which would be somewhere between nine and $10,000. Um, the safety committee and Jay has agreed that they would move forward with this. The first part of the program is that the selectmen would need to pass a resolve, uh, which is in your packet, um, that would allow us and uh, commit the town to participating in the program. So I have a question on that. Uh, is this is this incentive also open to other businesses besides town municipal or no? Or do you it know? would have to belong to the workers comp um, program through MMA. So because they're a they're an insurance pool. It's something they offer in their own insurance pool. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's always worth the, yeah. the question. Yep. Right, well, Sheila? I got to be thinking we're doing most of this stuff anyway, aren't we? <clears throat> I would say we are doing most of this stuff. I would say inspections, you know, doing kind of inspections of facilities is something 
that we could do a better job on and we've talked about in terms of having somebody from outside that department do an inspection because you tend to pass the same thing every day and you don't recognize it anymore. So having somebody with a fresh set of eyes. So I think it, you know, steps it up a little from what we're currently doing, but I think it's very doable. Good. Do I have a motion? This will be audited, right? The Lance Lemieux is one of our um, people that comes down and inspects our facilities. And so he would come down and audit this, yes. He works for the risk pool. Okay. I'll make a motion to participate in the MMA Workers' Compensation Safety Initiative. Incentive, excuse me. Second. All right. Um, Pat. Aye. Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. And show us this aye. Motion moves and next award wastewater bid for secondary clarifier upgrades. And I guess Chris is here. Hi, hey, good evening, everyone. Hi, Chris. Uh, so on April 6th, uh, we went out to bid for the rehabilitation work for both of our secondary clarifiers. Uh, the bids closed on May 11th at two o'clock PM. Uh, we did have four responsive bidders. Uh, one was Penta. Their total bid was $947,300. Northeast Mechanics, their total bid was $898,000. T-Buck Construction, their total bid was $995,511. And Apex Construction, uh, which was $951,250. Uh, did send the, the uh, bids off to Wright Pierce, uh, who is the engineering firm that we're working with for the clarifiers, and they performed an evaluation of the bids and did not see any issues with, uh, you know, um, awarding the bid uh, to the lowest bidder, which was Northeast Mechanics, $898,000. Uh, so that would be our recommendation. Have you worked with them before? I have not worked with them, um, but in looking at this, uh, Eric, uh, who is our engineer, did conduct some follow-up on this, and I believe he should be available to speak. He should be on. Yes, I'm here now. Okay, Eric, how do you feel uh, about East Earth mechanics? Yeah, so we, we did a little research. So, uh, you know, Northeast, Earth mechanics, uh, they, they do a lot more what they call uh, horizontal work. So basically, um, more uh, pump stations, force mains, sewer work. And however, they've been hiring people out of uh, Methuen construction was the people that were doing more of the internal work of some of these uh, plants, if you will. And Methuen, uh, at least based on the data that we're getting, is that they've been uh, losing some of their managers, if you will. And uh, Northeast has collected some of those individuals that have an experience in this kind of work. Uh, right Pierce, uh, their project managers did a fair amount of work. Uh, at, they've, they've worked with both. So they did not have an issue with Northeast. Um, but they also had experience with both because they did do Nashua and we reached out to Nashua, uh, New Hampshire's clarifier work that they did. I spoke with the superintendent today and he spoke with his engineer as well and felt comfortable with the, the superintendent that was, that's going to be our superintendent um, with the work that he did. Unfortunately, halfway through their project, they did lose that particular superintendent. So his, um, they, they did have good credibility, if you will, with that. So we didn't have issue with that. Um, we're, you know, not to delve too deep into what's going on with Methuen construction, but um, it sounds like the people that are in charge. And, uh, but what I really want to stress is that there's really four components. There's a general contractor, which is going to be Northeast, 
there is, but really they're purchasing from um, several, uh, three other uh, individuals. It's going to be AOL, uh, all, uh, MWell, which is one of the, they're going to create the mechanisms. The domes are going to be created or, or built by Apex and uh, another company is called Enduro is going to be creating the, or building the, uh, uh, the weirs as well. So there's a lot of the work is really being done by outside agencies is a general contractor, which is Northeast, but I just want to just people's concerns is, you know, uh, I just want to appease those concerns to say that the majority of the work is really going to be, um, the, the, the work, <laughs> the, the, what's being constructed offsite, if you will, uh, Northeast is really kind of installing the work. If you will, is it comfortable with them? Uh, am I? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry for being long winded, but oh, that, that's all yeah. right. No, explained well. No, <laughs> any other questions? I have one. What is alternate A? So, alternate A, Mike, is the dome covers. So, currently, the, the domes that we have that are existing now are in very poor shape. Not knowing uh, what the prices were going to come in at, given the uh, current, uh, you know, industry market, we weren't sure whether or not we were going to have the money to replace those domes. Um, but those came in much less than we had anticipated. So they need to be replaced, is what you're saying? Yes. Okay. We wanted to have them as part of the original bid. However, because we were so worried about pricing and what we were hearing, and maybe Chris, you could just highlight that we expected these bids to be over a million dollars. We were looking upwards of a million and a half. And so to get the prices we did, we're very pleased. Wonderful. I just wanted to know what alternative A was. That's all. I, know. Yep. I don't have a question about the choice. I don't know anything uh, enough about it to say it's right or wrong. And I trust the guys to do what they're doing. So uh, I just wonder what alternative A was. Thank you. Yeah. If I may, I mean, it's, it's, there is, it's removing fully removing the, the domes that are currently there now. And the question really about if they had to construct with the domes on, it's going to be a different construction, obviously, because they have to, to deal with the actual domes in place and then place all the mechanisms inside the yeah. clarifier, uh, with the domes on it's a cost associated with that. Yeah. This came in really well. I got you. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'll make a motion to award the bid to Northeast Earth Mechanics for $898,000. Thank you. Second? Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. And let's vote. And Pat? Aye. And Mike? Aye. Alan? Aye. Phyllis aye. says aye. Motion passes. Very good. Did you get Ed? Ed's back. Oh, I didn't see him. Okay. Ed, Ed. Ed, Ed's volume is off, though. Ed, can you hear? That's better. There you are. There, no, but I've had about enough of this technology. <laughs> can we meet in person next time, please? Do you, my, do I you want say to, I. Okay. I didn't know if you heard enough of it. Oh, I did. And I've had, this, and as I've said at other meetings, I've had the tour and uh, I understand well, as much as a layman can understand what's going on over there. Uh, Chris, an excellent guide. And I had the pleasure of meeting Eric for the first time. And uh, we went through the plant together. And you know, they said, if you guys get an opportunity, I, I highly recommend it. Great. Thank you. Um, we're, happy, we're happy to know they're getting good Yelp reviews. <laughs> uh, moving on. Um, award track for Wilds District Survey. And Mike Claus. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, 
So we're going to talk a little bit about Wallace District Road tonight. Um, we've got, we're, we're looking to get with the residents uh, in the Wallace District Road area and discuss some improvements for the road between the fire station and Cape Corpus uh, Square. Um, and to do that, we'd like to do something like we did on the Mills Road project and get a survey done and do sort of a preliminary layout of how we might do some improvements in that area for pedestrians and then get uh, get, a, get a response from, from the residents to see if they're in favor of that uh, and if we're going in the right direction. Um, in order to do that, we, we got quotes from three surveyors. Um, two of them thought we had to do a lot of deed work and uh, they came in with a much higher price. Uh, we talked with mainland development and they've, they've done this type of project for other towns. Uh, they think for what we're doing for a preliminary layout, uh, they can just do the actual physical right of way research um, and, and out in the field uh, and, and get a pretty good idea where the, where the right of way is. They, they think they can actually, they can get that pretty well from the field work. Um, so we can ensure the residents. If later there are some issues where we've got to go back and do some deed research, we can do that at a later date. But they didn't think doing research on every property uh, at this time was really going to be a, a cost-effective uh, use of our money. Uh, so we'd like to go with the mainland proposal, which will get us our survey data that we need, um, and then we can get some lay we can lay out where we're looking at for some improvements for the public, and uh, and have a public meeting to discuss it with folks. And go forward, and that'll get us. That'll get us where we want to need for next year's budget process. So, and like you're reading through that, we're not doing any abutter work. Is that it? We're not doing any deed research with that. Uh, they, they're going to look at. at they, they've got you know. They'll look at existing surveys. Um, they'll look at. Uh, they'll look at records. Um, but they're not, they're not going to certify the, 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 the property lines along the right of way with, with pins right now. They'll find what's existing and what's apparent um, with, with the field work. Um, but you know, what, if you're looking for a, uh, a stamped, quote unquote, stamped survey saying, that, you know, I certify that this corner is a property marker, we're not doing that at this time. Uh, you know, we may have to come back and do some of that work. Um, if we've got issues where we, we might be on, you know, we might be near someone's property or someone says, you know, this is mine, not in, and it's not in the right of way, you know, I, I, it's, you know, you, you run into that. Um, but, but if we run into that, uh, you know, we will we'll deal with it. Uh, and, and if enough people say, you know, this, this isn't what we want, you know, we can, we can actually back off and just fix the road where it is. I mean, that's always an option to take. Mike, the, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, is it, uh, Mike, clause. Is that why the other two bids were so much higher because they were actually going to certify the, the right of way? Yes. And you're comfortable with that? Yes, I think for the, at this point, yes. I, I think uh, we, we, we got to get, get an idea. We got to get an idea from the residents whether they were actually in favor of any expansion of that road. Um, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, uh, and it's and it's and frankly it's going to be costly. So we're going to have to bring that to you guys and make sure that that you're in favor of spending the money if we want to do these types of improvements. Um, but I think we'll have a very good idea just meeting with the residents where the conflicts are, and we can come back and, and do that research at a later date if it's needed. You know, did, did we give the same specs to everybody? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my purchasing heartburn goes up when I see uh, a difference of twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars between two of the quotes, or one is at thirty, one's at thirty-three, and the one we want to award is at eight thousand dollars. I'm not questioning the decision yet. I just want to know if we gave them the same specs, and if we didn't give them the same specs, why are we looking at mainland development uh, at eighty-two hundred dollars? I think what it is is that that is how uh, you know. I think both the other two surveyors just thought it'd be 
if they'd like to get it all done at once and that's the proposal they gave us what um, did we give them for specs did we give them all the same specs it was it was a request for proposals so we, we really didn't give them a specification um so you know we said here's what we want to do what do you think what do you think we should do as a surveyor and two of them came back and said well normally we do all the deed research and be higher and you know it 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 takes them you know it, that, that's what they wanted to give us um so i didn't go back and say well what if you just did this um, so what you're saying is we're probably likely to do it anyway at some point I, I don't know that I, you know i think it really depends on the how the public process goes i mean we if when we did mills road that was a state road and the state was requiring you know that type of survey level um before we started um they didn't want any kind of issues with takings or anything like that here you know we're looking at it we may have some issues uh with with people saying you know that i don't want you doing this and we'd have to before we go and do a lot of work on oh well that's ours or this is what that's worth you know we may want to say you know no if, if you don't want to work with us and 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 you know come up with an you know it, come up with a way to make pedestrian improvements work on your property then okay you know that that's our call as you know and, and i think that's a discussion down the road um is it a safety issue right now i what what i've talked to people just walking the road looking at what we could do you know i i stop and talk to the joggers on the road the people walking wallace district road they they've all told me it would be nice to have a sidewalk you know that is what that is what i've heard um it's, Mike, a, tough I, road, it's a tough road to walk i travel wilds district every day and between walkers and bikers it can be very dangerous because there are many curves some hills and and uh it it, it can be dangerous i i think my properties are involved excuse me how many properties are involved in that in this well, I, I i think it's eric was it 0.9 miles of road 1.4 miles 1.4 sorry yeah 1.4 miles i mean so you're talking if frontage most of those frontages are around 200 feet or so say you know that's that's quite there's quite a number of houses there and i i, I think we're going to need to hear from the property owners that they want to talk to us we're gonna, and, and we can meet with them and say you know here we're coming close to your property how do you want to work with us to make this work um without without going through a lot of legal maneuvers if they're if people agree to it we can say you know here's here's the improvements here's the apparent right away are you guys okay with doing that uh and if someone's not going to contest it we can make that go work real quick it's it's when you don't have agreement with people and you start saying well we're going to do this and it's for the public good and that's why we're doing it um that i think you know you're going to start getting heartburn so and i you know you don't want the phone calls from us and saying what the heck is public works doing on my property you know i i want to meet with people and say get everybody on board saying this plan looks good for us and it looks good for it looks good for the town i mean i think it's a real amenity to have a sidewalk in front of your house um and that that's going to be our pitch if it's if it's something many of the residents want um then i think you'll hear that and if it's not we'll we'll hear the other thing yeah but this is a safety issue for i won't ride my bike over there anymore so it, it's it's a safety issue so why why isn't the town i understand being inclusive but why isn't the town making the decision that we need to do something and 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 and, and come up with a plan to do it and then present it uh it seems to me that i i agree with sheila it is so dangerous for people walking it's so dangerous for people it's dangerous for people driving for god's sakes because they have to go around the bikers and they have to go around the walkers etc cetera, etc cetera. 
And I, I just, I'm looking at it, I'm saying, well, wait a minute, if we know we got an issue and it's a safety issue, what are we waiting for? I don't understand. Can we even come up with a plan without a survey, Mike? Pause. Well, I think given that we have the apparent right of way, we can come up with a plan to bring to the residents uh, and, make, and make sure we're in the right, that we're all in the right ballpark. And, you know, I, I hear you're saying, you know, we've got to do it for safety, but, you know, you're, you're talking about a, a large expenditure, and if the residents don't want it, uh, you're going to hear that. Um, I don't know if it's a case, I, I understand the residents' issues, yeah. but, you know, there's a lot of tourists here, there's a lot of people who are using that road, myself included, that it's dangerous. And so um, I just say, look, if we had a plan, then 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 we've we've got something we can present rather than than uh, go in and, and get I don't know 70 80 opinions. I mean, we I, well, I and I think I think Mike, maybe we could talk a little bit about your plan was to do it similar to Mills Road, and in Mills Road you did the survey work, and then you had a digital plan that we printed out to show where the shoulder when we're talking sidewalk we're really talking a shoulder. Um, we're on the side of the, a, we're not talking a sidewalk. Well, we're not talking probably a curb sidewalk. We're talking a stripe down the road. Well, that's, uh, can I? No, I, I can I, I think we have a couple options here. So you've got about a twenty to twenty-two foot wide road there now. Um, so a sidewalk, a curb sidewalk is going to need about six feet. Um, if you did. Then, then if you want to add a shoulder on the other side, you need a couple more feet. Um, if you wanted to do shoulders on both sides, you'd need even more. Realistically, um, with the way the phone poles are laid out, where the utility poles are laid out, it really restricts you on one side of the road or the other. Uh, those, those, a lot of those utility poles are tight to the road. Um, and that, that's, so I think you know, that's where we may we may end up being able to get a sidewalk in there and and sort of leave the bike lanes and leave the lanes where they are. Um, you know, you can put up signs that saying uh, will you restrict those those lanes? Uh, you say you know the bikes can take the you can use spots where you can say the the bike can take the road, the lane uh, where they where it might need to for safety, but. I, I, I think you know the, the bicycle length being you know a little over a mile isn't that long for a bike, but it certainly is long for a pedestrian. Um, and and when we look at our connectivity to the village, um, to Cape Corpus Village, that that's where I think the pedestrian safety is is where we want to go. You know my my gut on that is if I can get six feet extra on that road. Um, I'm doing good. It's just not, there's not a lot there if you've gone down that road uh, and just look at what's, what's right next to the edge of the road. Um, so it's not going to be an easy project anyway. Um, we, can, we can look at a number of options um, and, and hear from everybody what they want and what they're willing to live with for construction. Um, I think Mills Road was a little different in that it was a longer road and it, and it had a lot of bike traffic on it. Um, this one has a lot of bike traffic, but I think the interruption is shorter and the bikes can move along pretty quick uh, as compared to Mills Road. But that, that, that's preliminary now. What, what, I, what I'd like to do is be able to get a layout and, and then we can, as we did on Mills Road, just lay out the options and we can show those, those different options to people and get their opinion on just safety and and uh, and how much how much we want to you know go outside of the right of way? Um, how long is our right of way? I said it's going to ask. It's probably a fifty foot right of way. What did you say? Fifty feet. Fifty feet all the way. Yeah, I believe so. Looking at what we what we've got currently in in the research. So, in reality, we wouldn't have to be taking anybody's or or trying to purchase or having a problem with any, any uh, landowners if we have a 50 foot right away, isn't that correct? You've got the issues of, of you know, existing stone walls, 
Um, you've got some ledge problems where you might want to not take ledge and go around the ledge. Um, you've got trees that, you know, you've got valuable trees in the right of way. Do you want to take those? I, you know, it's not an easy answer just to say you got 50 feet. You know, we're not, we're not planning on clear cutting there. Unless you've got the utility poles on one side tight, um, there might How be many involved. Yeah, there might be right away on, on, on uh, so we, it's, it's not an easy answer. I think once we have a plan and we can sort of sketch out our options, it's going to be a lot easier to look at. I'm just going to say spend over $30,000 where we can, to get the, uh, to get the physical layout and then sketch it out uh, when we can get that for 8,000. How many poles are involved? Poles? Yeah. Are, are, are I, I, think that, I think the section from about Land's End all the way to um, Old Wilds District Road, Old Big Lane area, all those poles are right tight to the road there. You know, is, that's the section I'm really worried about, you know, impacting the, uh, I'd say, the, uh, the inland side of Wilds District Road. So we're talking a similar project then to Mills Road, Mike? I, I'm thinking we're more like, I think it's going to look, I'm thinking we can get a, a curb sidewalk in and, and perhaps leave the lanes as they are, perhaps widen the lanes a little bit. Um, but I don't think you're going to get a you know, North, North Street side, sized road in that right away. Yeah, I gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I, that's a question to come. Maybe people want a more flat road, but I, just talking to people, I heard sidewalk, you know, get them up on a curb that separates them from the cars. So you think that so the land would give you, give you what you need then? I, I think to get us started and get a planning, get a good idea on where we're going to need to go for planning and costs. Yeah, yes, this will get us where we need to be. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to authorize a contract of mainland development for $8,200. And I'll second that. And Pat Briggs. Aye. Ed. Aye. Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. And Sheila says aye. Good, good, uh, good explanation, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep Thank you up to date. I, I heard your concerns, so we will take those. Take Thanks, those I, I appreciate it too. Thank okay. you. Uh, moving on, item 10, accept contract with host compliance for SCR software, short-term rental software. And we have Warner in the audience. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, so, uh, so after we, uh, you know, we went through our process with getting the short-term rental, uh, ordinance, uh, passed and the budget passed, uh, you know, I've been working with, uh, host compliance on, you know, looking at what the town's, you know, needs may be in terms of the software, you know, that we've been, you know, that we've been discussing, uh, for our, you know, for the licensing of short-term rentals. So, uh, you know, as, as you can see, uh, you know, I think, you know, I, I can tell you, I was pleasantly surprised with the number that came in. Um, you know, what we found was that, um, you know, is that they agreed to honor a number, uh, that was, uh, of related to rentals, uh, that were, you know, that were on the, you know, on the books or that they had found, you know, back when we first started having the conversation. And so they had locked that number in. Uh, and, and, and so what, what's important to know is that this number will, you know, it will change from year to year, you know, as we continue to move forward with them, but it'll be based on the number of, of rental units that were, um, you know, that were, were shown to be in existence in the town, you know, from the, you know, from the past year. So, uh, you know, I've, you know, we've, like I said, we've been working with them. Uh, we've, uh, looked at a demo of their software numerous times. Uh, they also offer, you know, a number of, of, uh, you know, good educational opportunities for, you know, for staff, 
uh, as well. Uh, and so I'd like to uh, recommend that we uh, move forward with uh, the contract with Granicus uh, host compliance uh, for a short-term rental software uh, in the amount of $22,302.95. Um, you can also see uh, I did uh, receive another proposal from another software company. Uh, you know, they are not quite as extensive as host compliance. Uh, they, uh, they, you can see they were in the ballpark uh, in terms of the numbers, uh, but didn't have as, as many offerings and uh, did not, uh, they, the closest that they operated really was uh, into our area was in Vermont, uh, as opposed to host compliance, which if you look at the main communities that are regulating short-term rentals, uh, they almost all exclusively use uh, host compliance for that service. Sounds good to me. Make a motion that we um, hire host compliance Granicus for $22,302.95. Second. Second. Sorry. Uh, Pat Briggs. Aye. Ed. Aye. Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. And Sheila says aye. Motion is moved. Very good, Warner. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. And next, Jono and Zaloni of the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative will speak to us uh, to yeah. discuss. Go ahead, Lori. I was just going to ask Dave if he could bring up Jono from the attendees. And, well, and while he is getting promoted, um, I would just introduce that Jono is the executive director for the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative. Um, the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative is a fairly new organization, but they're doing uh, tremendous work uh, across the United States and uh, looking to headquarter uh, in a place close to our hearts. And I think Jono has some exciting uh, news to just educate and share with people about KCI as well as their future plans. Thank you so much, Lori. Good evening, everybody. Appreciate the time of the select board and really just excited to provide you an update from our Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative and the work that we're doing to activate youth voices around climate action. I don't know if I am able to share the sound on the screen. Let me just try a quick sound check. And the select, select men, are you able to see the screen okay? No. no. It says you stop. Yep, it's not quite there yet. Perfect, let's just give it a moment. It says I'm sharing, hopefully it's not the bandwidth. Got it now. Yeah. Awesome. Let me go ahead and start and um, I'll look for a verbal cue if the sound's coming through. Okay. KCI really gives youth the opportunity to take on a leadership role. KCI has given me opportunities to get more involved in the climate world. Hi, this is KCI Ambassador Anna Larifi, and I'm super excited about renewable energy. Wave energy is kind of new to the field of renewable energy. KCI Ambassadors are really trying to increase awareness on climate change issues. They have the chance to bring their ideas for their local areas where they live and then get the support and resources they need to turn them into reality. KCI's goal is to reach 10 million youth by 2025. Hope is a driving factor for me. If I was not hopeful, then I wouldn't be motivated to do the work that I'm doing. A lot of communities impacted by climate change are members of the BIPOC community. Our priority at KCI is to help empower those youth to bring their perspectives to the table. By becoming a KCI ambassador, you would have the resources and support of the organization to figure out your how and get the connections you need in your community. My piece of advice for youth would be to not wait. You should definitely join KCI. 
Thanks for letting me show the short video. I think the youth deliver the message best in terms of our overall mission and really the start of the Kenny Bunkport Climate Initiative right in our, our backyard in Kenny Bunkport with the Gulf of Maine Field Studies course. And really the idea was the partnership with RSU 21 and the University of New England with Dr. Pam Morgan and Melissa Lucci, who is environmental science teacher at RSU 21 and bringing science outside the walls of the classroom in a very nonpartisan way and really to educate youth around their landscapes, whether it be invasive species or sea level rise um, or other issues that are really personalized for them in their journey as young adults, high schoolers in particular and undergraduate students in college to learn more about climate science and the STEM related fields around climate action. So our mission is pretty bold and vague at the same time, which is to empower youth voices for climate action in a very nonpartisan way. And one of the key distinctions that we're very proud of is that we really wanna give students, high schoolers and young adults, the tools to engage in civic conversations with their elected officials, with their parents, with their community, and especially when there may not always be groupthink in terms of what they're experiencing in their own landscapes. So communication skills come with a lot of the work that we're doing with the high school and college youth, as well as incorporating how to decipher some of the data that they may be experiencing in their own communities. I won't bore you with the history. Uh, many of you know that we really blossomed as a program out of the Kenny Bunkport Conservation Trust three years ago when the Gulf of Maine Field Studies course really started. And the board of KCT, as well as several of our donors said, this is a model that can really work across the country in a way that embraces all voices for high school and college youth to really embrace climate science as something to dialogue with in their communities, whether it's Nebraska where I grew up where we're seeing extreme droughts followed by extreme weather events like 500 year floods, or in coastal communities like in Maine. Our approach is, is very simple. Um, the simplicity is probably the secret sauce. We not only take education outside the walls of the classroom, but really looking to empower youth and to activate them in their communities in a way that goes beyond simply teaching the climate science. So the way that we do that is we have free high school educational curricula, small c. They're bite-sized modules that educators from across the country can pick up since we started in Maine, we now have 53 high schools across the country in 25 states that have reached 4,300 students. And there are modules around renewable energy and sea level rise and other topics that educators don't have to go to a school board to have integrated into the curricula, but really can be plug and play based off of some of the National Science Teacher Association guidelines and standards, as well as this idea of creating a club or coalition for youth to feel like they're part of something depending on where they're at within their local landscape. So we started in Kenny Bunkport. We're very committed to staying in Kenny Bunkport, which is part of our excitement in present, presenting this today to the selectmen, is really looking at our national strategy as was talked about in the video. We hope to reach 10 million youth by 2025. And currently we're focusing on Maine and California as priority states. And this year also expanding in California, Texas and Pennsylvania, while our digital reach is all over the place. So we have youth that have signed up in Uganda and Bangladesh um, and really are pulling from the resources that we have online since they are available at no cost and are currently available in English and being translated into Spanish as well. This is just a little bit of, about what we hope to do. Um, our hope is to have a yeah, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Supposedly, I'm nominated for the budget board, and I'm supposed to be introduced. Maybe Lori's mic. Oh, is it? Are you Rick? Yeah. Yep. You were appointed by the moderator. Yeah. Ah, perfect. Um, sorry about that. So, really, just our ambitions to help get to 10 million youth is kind of laid out here in incremental steps, um, so that we're growing the organization at a healthy rate. And importantly, what I love to see some of the youth that you see here: Jack Reese, Sophie Farrick are actually based here in Kenny Bunkport, just an example of what we're hearing from youth. Um, not anecdotally, many of the youth that we have engaged as youth ambassadors have come to us and said, we really appreciate the nonpartisan approach that KCI offers. There are amazing organizations that are out there that just have a different approach. They may be a more pithy approach or a more partisan approach. And many of the youth that have come to us have said, 
they feel like there needs to be a safe space to dialogue and not to create additional anxiety around the topics that are important to them and really to teach them the civil engagement skills that we know are necessary in a world that has varying opinions and varying perspectives. Um, so this is an example of those youth. And then importantly, one of the key things that we saw in the Gulf of Maine Field Studies course is 13 out of the 17 students that went through that program are going on to study STEM, science, technology, engineering, math um, subjects around environmental science. And it's just a great way to really cultivate high school students leading into their college years to think about the fields um, that are largely going to not only lead to the next generation of leaders, um, but we're also seeing an incredible boom economically within these fields and a gap that needs to be filled. So we feel that it's an important economic engine as well. And then last but not least, um, as Lori mentioned, we're excited that we're formally embarking on our search for a home in Kennebunkport. Uh, Tom Bradbury and the KCT board, the Conservation Trust Board, have been very kind in allowing us to squat in their headquarters as our staff has grown and we're just running out of space. So we've done some due diligence in looking for different sites. We've scoped out five properties within the Kenny Bunkport area. Um, one of the pieces that we are really excited just to explore a little bit further with the selectmen is possibly looking at the village parcel and trying to have a very modest footprint. While it will be our headquarters for all the work that we're doing across the globe, we only anticipate around 10 to 15 full-time staff being at the headquarters. And importantly, a prototype design that you see on the screen here is having a big space for communities to come together. So really creating a space that if there are other community organizations in Kenny Bunkport that need facilities or meeting space, that they're welcome to join us within whatever facility we happen to find wherever in Kenny Bunkport. Um, and importantly, to attract youth as they're coming in for summer camps or experiences with the ecology school up in Saco, um, we really want to embody the headquarters in a way that is very much within the taste of the New England vernacular um, in a modest approach. Approximately 7,800 square feet is what we're thinking for our headquarters site. Um, but just really thrilled to continue the, the search and the conversation. Um, we are beginning to share um, with the public our intentions of looking for a headquarters and um, kind of giving them a feel for where our staff are. You may recognize some of the names on the screen here. Leigh Lowry's been in town for a very long time working at the Conservation Trust and is helping to really spearhead our programming of KCI as we build out, as well as staff from coast to coast. We have staff in Guam and California, um, Texas, Louisiana, Miami, and several of us that are based here in Maine. But really appreciate the time to be able to at least share a brief update and our hopes and ambitions for uh, the months to come, and I'll yield for any questions that the selectmen may have. Well, I personally, I, I, I love the idea. Um, I think centering your offices uh, in Kennebunk Port and, and offering the public um, what what you have to offer is great for our community. John, can I just ask you to stop sharing for a minute so we can see each other again? Oh, sorry, you bet, you bet. Any? Oh, go ahead, Sheila, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, any, any more comments? Oh. I, think it's, I, I think it's a great uh, uh, initiative and uh, uh, it's good to hear that uh, somebody's interested in, in maybe uh, utilizing the village parcel. I mean, that's that's. Uh, uh, I know that they're out looking for, and, and have looked at a number of different sites. And uh, if that's something that works, I think that would be terrific for us. Uh, but I I just think the whole thing is a great, a great. Uh, uh, it would be a great addition to Kennebunkport and a help to us. That's I, I, feel, I feel the same way you do, Mike. Mm -hmm. I think it'd be great, uh, especially if we could do something with the village parcel uh, with them, if you know, we need to look at it and talk about it and everything. I think this is a good beginning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I also agree with you, because I think it, what it'll do is it'll put Kenny Bunkport on the map more than just a resort area, but uh, potentially an educational center. And that expands uh, our 
awareness of a huge area. I think it's something we should explore and talk about. I, I, I really do. Yep, absolutely. I don't think Ed has, Ed, you're on mute. Sorry, I'm on my phone and I don't really care much for this platform. <laughs> but uh, I'm open for, you know, the village parcel. We've had a, we've already had a meeting with John O, as, as you all know, and you know, I'm just waiting to hear what the next steps are. Very good. Well, okay. thank you. There's a lot of upside to this for the for the town of Kenny Bunkford. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as we discussed, climate change is going to impact Kenny Bunkford in every possible angle, um, whether we're talking physically or socioeconomically. Um, basically what we think of a Kenny Bunkport today and what we value um, is, is going to change in the future. The question is to what degree. And so really, I think it's an opportunity for us to um, work with PC KCI as a partner to really leverage um, our capacity to address those issues in the future. Um, John, oh, perhaps you could just differentiate for people the difference between KCI and KCT, because um, you know I heard you mention Tom Bradbury's name, and people think of him as KCT, and and think that KCI and KCT are the same thing, and and I think the confusion is why wouldn't you just uh, perhaps have your headquarters there with KCT? Hey, it's a it's a great point, Lori. I think. Two, two distinctions. One is really a legal distinction. Uh, the board and a number of donors really wanted to keep the, the true focus and intent of KCT within the geographical confines of what KCT has in terms of, of conservation. And when there was great interest from a number of funders outside of the state of Maine to try to reach 10 million youth, uh, the math didn't add up in the state of Maine or in Kenny Court. And they said, well, let's not go into um, mission creep for KCT and, and possibly program outside of that encatchment. Um, so one was purely to not uh, move away from the intent of what KCT's mission is. Um, however, having said that, while we have a separate board of directors and um, separate IRS filing, we distinctly kept three of the KCT board members in the bylaws of KCI for strong belief um, that I personally appreciated coming into the organization, that part of what makes KCI and KCT so successful is a localized agenda, really preserving the heritage and the culture of our communities, whether it be sea level rise or other risks that climate uh, may pose. Um, so we will continue, unless there's an amendment of our bylaws, to have a strong connection to KCT because we were born out of KCT. Um, the educators that really inspired KCI to become what it is came from KCT programming. Um, so out of our currently 11 board members, uh, we currently have more than the three that are in the bylaws that are in and from the Kenny Bunkport area uh, by design. But Funding streams are a little bit different, um, as well as the overall mission. While we're not going to purchase land and conserve land, we're really focused on the youth voices to possibly go on to do things like conservation, but uh, legally distinct as well as the mission. So if the board is so inclined, then I will continue conversations with Jono to bring back a proposal to the board. That's a great idea. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That works. Very good. Thank you all. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Good to see you again. Likewise. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Moving on to item 12. Recommendations from um, the BAC regarding beach fire permits. And so we have um, John Dykstra and Kathleen Burke in the audience. And I'm asking Dave to bring them up. Okay. 
Hey, will I be able to share screen? Thank you, sir. And Kate, you're on mute. And you're right. Okay. And I'm not there. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're you're with us. Okay. Well, let's let me back up just a minute. Um, and John will um, certainly explain shortly the guts of what our motion involved. I just want to give you just a little background information. Um, as you know, during the summer of 2020, uh, because of COVID concerns, um, the town decided to stop issuing any beach fire permits uh, for Goose Rocks Beach. And so when we came forward to this summer, um, we took a look at the issue and uh, at I believe it was our mid-June meeting and found that um, there were differing viewpoints um, on both sides of whether to restart or whether to stay in a moratorium or, or end them completely. So um, we appointed um, John Dykstra and Joanne Gustin, uh, two members of the committee, volunteered to be an ad hoc subcommittee to look at the issue more closely and try and work out um, some compromise that would be satisfactory to everybody on the committee. We also spent time talking with um, getting some input. We spent time talking to Lori. We got input from the chief of police and the fire chief. Um, and, you know, I think both very important input to us or certainly to several of us on the committee in terms of how we wanted to proceed going forward. Um, I don't know if we have any new input, Lori. Can you speak to that at all? Not yet. We don't have any other new input, no. Um, you know, so I don't know how they'll feel about our proposal, but I do say that uh, just to give you this input, if you haven't seen it already, briefly, the fire chief this is pre the proposal that we've now put forward, had said any change to current practices are an improvement. Um, they still need to use uh, a full-time police officer to monitor beach fire, a beach any night that there are fires going on and to check to make sure at 10 or 10.30, whatever the time is, that all fires are out. Um, and then again, they need to possibly be checked the next day in order to make sure that it, all the debris has been cleaned up. <laughs> Um, had some interesting things to say, but some of it re re relates to fires in general in this town. Um, but he said specifically, my concern with fires on the beach is the wind. The winds along the shore can be very unpredictable in speed and direction, carrying embers into dune grasses or onto someone else's property. The other issue the wind creates as far as firefighting goes is it's drying properties especially to vegetation in the area, since permits are only allowed regardless of location on a low or moderate fire danger scale provided by the main forest service, the conditions of the beach can be very different for and drier than other places in town. This is due to the almost constant breeze along the shore. For this reason, I am in favor of not allowing them on the beach. Uh, I do not have any issues with a grill on the beach for purposes of cooking food only um, and it refers then to the fact that any such fires around town are also subject to permit, which I think whatever, that's not our purpose, however. So we also, um, with that as background, we also surveyed other towns that have similar beach towns. We went, we looked at Old Orchard down through York, and I apologize to Kittery because I forgot about Kittery. Um, in, that, in that survey, we found out that uh, the, we, if we were to continue allowing beach fires, would be the, the only town other than Biddeford that allows private campfires on their beach. Um, all the other towns, no camp, no fires at all permitted on the beach. Um, a concord, I mean, sorry, old, old Orchard only allows special event, um, much larger groups, and they have to provide an, an insurance policy in the town as a named insured. Uh, Kenny Bunk, for example, they don't allow any fires on the beach. Now they do have that sort of rocky, Turkin talking to Merton, the rocky outcrop, I think it's near the Narragansett, that he believes it actually has some built-in fire pits there and there are one or two campfires are permitted in that location only. So, um, so with 
some of that background information, uh, oh, with the other information we thought was very interesting, we asked um, Lori and the police department if they could come up with some statistics on how many campfires had been had in say 2019. It was a little difficult and I really appreciate their efforts because of the way, because of the way records are kept and the bundling of, of records in some instances. So, but thanks to their best efforts, it looks like we had over 200 and about 214 campfires um, in the summer of 2019. So we decided that we needed to go ahead and get public input, more public input than we had a chance to that night of our first meeting that we discussed the subject. So we held a public meeting on June 29th focused only on the issue of beach fires. And we got a fair amount of input. And I will say that um, almost all of the input was in favor of please continue this, that it's a much beloved tradi tradition for many, pretty much everybody who was calling in or on Zoom was, I would say a long time resident or long time seasonal visitor. And they felt that this was a very important and much beloved tra tradition that their families had enjoyed for many years. So with all of that input together, and I'm gonna turn this over to John, who has um, really been integrally involved in the issue and will give you more detail on uh, what were the issues that were identified and what were the solutions we came up with. Thanks, thanks Kate. Um, this slide lists what the primary issues and concerns that were identified. One was the amount of ash, embers, and burnt wood that was left on and often buried uh, in the beach sand, uh, not removed as is required by the old permit. Uh, also an extensive amount of smoke uh, that was uh, collected in front of Proctor Avenue, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, and it was an extensive amount of smoke that would go down the, the Proctor Avenue area. There was a vulnerability of the dune grass uh, and other flammable material. Uh, there was a lack of any clear statement of liability in the permit. Uh, and there's an extensive liability that I'll mention in a moment, but that wasn't clearly outlined in the permit. Uh, and then there is a substantial burden on the police. So the, you know, checking the fires to be sure they are within code is certainly a responsible police activity. But then there was also the requirement they had to follow up the next day, uh, locate where the fire was, and then check that compliance to the permit was met. Uh, and that, that in the summer in a busy time uh, is a real burden in the current uh, uh, procedure, current permit procedure. And then uh, Kate mentioned the substantial number of fires. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run through quickly uh, our recommendations to try to address each of these each of these issues. In terms of the ash and the ember, uh, what, and this is the biggest change really, is that we are recommending that we no longer allow fires in the sand, uh, that they need to be in a metal container. As Kate mentioned, this is what's so at Biddeford. Uh, it greatly uh, increases the safety factor for the fire. Uh, uh, and uh, also the other piece uh, is to increase the security deposit. Currently, the way the process works is that a $50 deposit is left with the police and that's why the police have to go and inspect the site in the morning in order to release that $50. Our suggestion is to increase that to 250. 50 simply isn't enough skin in the game for people to clean up after themselves. As sad as that sounds, that really seems to be the case. $50 is a cheap fee to let someone else take care of it. So we recommend going to 250. The smoke issue, uh, this is the old setup. Uh, and uh, I don't know, do we see it here? This is the old setup. Uh, and you can see that all five fires were sitting uh, in the old permit scheme, right in front of Proctor Avenue. Uh, pretty clear why when all fires are burning, there was an extensive amount of smoke with the uh, sea breeze uh, hitting this area. So what we have proposed is reducing the number uh, to three. So from five to three, and to spread them out along the beachfront. Uh, they are all in front of KCT lots. KCT has allowed us, they are signers of the beach use agreement and have given their permission as they did previously for the location of these fires to have the fire located in front of their lots. 
um, in terms of spreading the fire. Again, metal container, that's huge. Uh, we're also putting in, we would suggest, putting in a requirement to the permit. They have to be within, uh, not within, 20 feet of the dune grass or the seawall. Uh, require a size limit on the fire. That's already in the permit. Uh, require that a bucket of water be kept with the fire. That, this was uh, both the, uh, I believe the chief of police mentioned this, but several folks who are quite responsible with their fires on the beach said this was a critical piece, makes a lot of sense, particularly to cool the uh, fire container uh, so that it can be removed that night and then require that the uh, permit holder stays with the fire uh, at all times. There's the thought of liability and simply our suggestion is add a statement of liability, something on the order of the permit holder is responsible for the fire if it escapes and here's the key, also liable for the suppression costs as well as any damage caused to other property. Uh, this is a, uh, a standard uh, clause for anyone having an open fire. Uh, and then the burden on the police. Our suggestion is to have our community safety officers, the CSOs, uh, be responsible uh, to uh, check each day. They can, they can find where the fires were from the police at South Street or whatever, and then report back via phone or text to say that indeed compliance was, uh, was met and the $250 deposit can be released. So that's our recommendation, is that we do recommend um, the public input, particularly driven by that, that we continue with fires on the beach. But there's gonna be a maximum of six, not 10 permits. So three in the, in the, uh, uh, along the east end for uh, any public to do, and then three allowed by beachfront owners in front of their property. Fires must be contained, 250 deposit, 20 feet and 100 feet from nesting birds, bucket of water, and a signed liability statement. So that is my fire hose, and I apologize to KCI. I'm putting more carbon in the air, wanting to have beach fires. But uh, so that's, uh, that's our proposal. I'm open to questions. Um, John, I'm in favor of uh, your recommendations, all except for one. And I think, and that one is, I think $250 is a lot of money uh, for a security deposit. I would I'd be in favor of 150. I just think $250 is, is quite a reach. That's, that's the only point I have. In the whole as, thing. You know, as you know, as long as they comply, the check is torn up. Right. I, Not I yeah. as 250 it says a uh, uh, it's you can't have a check you have to have a money order which oh, means no no no, no that, that's not correct if that I, if that's what it says it was a misprint it's no, not it, 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 it says check slash money order yeah it should be check or money order yeah oh, right yeah, yeah and that's usually how it's done that's how it's almost always been done sheila people bring in they write the check and then the police tear up the check uh, I, I hear Alan's. I hear Alan's point. I mean, it could it could limit people. Just the thought of putting down two hundred and fifty dollars is is a mental barrier. And so, uh, if if that's how the board felt, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't have agreed. It's much better than fifty. Fifty is just too little. I agree with that too. Fifty is yeah. too little. Yeah. I think two fifty is uh, too reach. <laughs> but I feel I'm comfortable with one hundred and fifty. And everything else that you propose, uh, I would like to see the fires be able to come back. It's been here, for, it, we've done it forever and ever and ever. And I, I just hate to see things uh, disappear and never come back. Well, I gotta tell you, I'm in favor of the $250. I've been down there on a Sunday morning when there's, you step in the sand and it's still smoldering. Yeah. Uh, and I, I tell you, if you ask me that the, the first thing that could happen to you is that somebody's going to get hurt. And I think with the metal containers, it's going to be better, but you still got the issue. And I think $250 makes people think. I don't mm -hmm. think $150 makes people think, but $250, you make people think. There's been so much damage down there, uh, or debris, I meant, left. There's been fires that are just covered up by sand. And like I say, they smolder all night. You get down there, 
and they're still smoking. And that not last year, of course, but, but in previous years, I think. And I think uh, there's a cost for us to go down and do a lot of that stuff too. So uh, it's not cheap, but you know, if they comply with everything, if they comply with everything, they get their money back. So the traditional new item is the, is the metal container. Is there any idea of what you're looking at, like a 55 gallon drum? Or, or what is it? Is there a standard for this? We, we really didn't specify a standard. Our assumption is it would be fire pits. It would be something with handles that would be relatively easy to move because the stipulation is that it must be removed the night of the fire. So you carry it in and you, you have your fire. Uh, that's why the bucket of water is important. Uh, you put the fire out to cool the bin and you carry it off, hopefully with handles. This is something that was recommended by one of the residents who actually is a fireman or uh, has fire experience. And this is what he does. And it, it, it's very doable. And I think it makes a lot of sense. If they want to bring a 55 gallon drum uh, for a three foot fire, they can do it, but they got to get it off the beach that night. Yeah. Along with all its contents. With again, no dumping of any of the stuff that's in it out on the beach. Because oh, well, we're back have the problem, as Mike has pointed out. I know of people that have actually burnt their feet. That's right. Walking across the sand the next morning, not expecting that there was burning embers still <laughs> underneath the sand. But well, we've done the we've done the metal we've done the metal uh, uh, containers. It's like a little fire. It is like yeah. a little fire pit. It's small. You can buy them. They have handles on both sides. You can carry it out, and uh, we've done that, and uh, it works. Uh, you know, it's it's not as romantic as the old fire in the sand, but you know, this is a compromise. Things things just do have to change. We still want to have the fires. But I think if you have a metal container, unless I'm missing something here, and um, I've had good many a campfire from Boy Scouts to the islands as a kid, and all over the place, and even on the beach. Um, in order to get that container cool enough to take it out, you're going to have to put water into it. Where's the water going to go? That's it comes right. from the bucket that you're required to have next to the water, next to the fire. Yeah. Where's it going to go, John? That, right. That's my question. It's going to sink down it's into the sand? No, it's going to stay in the bucket. It's no, going to no, it's, in no, the it has holes, and then all the ash and all the black and all the nasty is going to go right into the beach. All the, ash, all the ash stays there now, Ed. Yeah. All of the I ash stays there now. Um, all stays there now. Why don't we just require that they have the fires below the, the high water mark? Uh -huh. That way, if they don't play by the rules and aren't nice and they bury it, when the tide comes in, at least it will go out. And come back in. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to get a lot of washed up burnt wood and detritus and most people don't want to fire down in the wet sand you want to you want to sit around it you want to I mean, that just well I, I certainly never chose to have a fire in the wet sand right well that sand's pretty hard packed down there i, sure. I don't know I, I i don't like you know i i get the the point of you know we've always done this we've done this and it's great but i just see that it's going to cause more problems then it's going to solve, mm -hmm. you know, any of this. Because we can write all the rules and the regulations we want, yeah, but I don't know that no matter what we do, people will follow them. You know, if you're here for a couple of days and you don't plan on coming back, what do you care if you leave it there and you lose well, your $150? You might, you, might, you might have that, Ed. You're always going to have a few bad apples. But I think the uh, – I, I still think the 250 is important just for the reason you mentioned. Uh, that it, you know, it's a little harder to, to just leave it. Uh, and, you know, all, all these fire pits have holes in the bottom. The, the, water, the water will drain out. It will carry the last with it, but that's no problem. But the one in my house doesn't have holes in the bottom. I had to drill holes in it because it kept filling up with water every time it uh, rained. Well, mine has cold, mine has holes. You know, maybe maybe we need to specify it has holes in the bottom. That sounds a little much. I mean, the, the intent is there. Don't leave the wood. Don't leave the embers. If you pour out a little bit of ash to pour the water out, that's fine. I, I you know, I don't I don't see that it's a problem myself. Well, I'm going to change my mind about the 150. I think that now that I've 
listen to some of your points of view on that, I, I think I'd be okay with the 250. 250, thank you. Thank you. I was gonna, Alan, I was gonna agree with you at 150. <laughs> Leave 150. I couldn't hear what you said. I agree with the Goose Rock speech committee that $250 will get people's attention. I yeah. agree with that. I was going to say 150, I would be hard pressed to leave 150 behind. But I know, you, yeah, but a lot I, of people don't care. I yeah. would be too. I wouldn't leave, I even wouldn't, I wouldn't want to leave 50 behind. Well, I, I, I might say that I'd be hard pressed to pay 5,000 to $6,000 a week for a house too, but a lot of people are doing it. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. that's the reality of where we are at Goose Rocks. Well, I'm more concerned about bringing the fires back than I am the fees. So. I, I would like to see us go back to where we were as far as bringing the fires back. I think it's something that's been a tradition for many, many years. And I think it's, it, it's a good thing to have. Uh, would I like to see it stay at 150? I would, but I, I'm thinking that, you know, the 250, they would definitely, you know, to me, $50 is a lot of money. Fine. But right. maybe two fifty isn't the sum. I don't know. And, and I just think it's a lot. But I would. I just want to bring the fires back. So. Well, I'd like to make a proposal, and this may end the discussion for tonight. That I'm willing to go along with this, just as it's written right here. But that we reevaluate this at the end of the summer. We see how it went, how it worked, and then we put a more permanent. Absolutely. I'd second that. I I'd think second that's that. I do. I think that's wise, Ed. Yep. Yeah. I do too. And I think it also exactly. gives the fire chief more of a chance to weigh in and see how it's working under the new. Remember, as the old way, he was basically saying he would not like to see that happen again, and this would give us a chance to try a compromise, uh, see if it works, see if it makes um, him feel more comfortable as far because the issues of the wind and the drying and the vegetation and the fact that I think are very valid ones. Um, so, and I'm sorry, you know, that we haven't had a chance to get his input uh, before this meeting on this, the subject, but I, I, th I think that sounds like a yep. very reasonable suggestion. We'll make sure he's there at the next meeting. Right. Uh, but I would like to know at the end of the year, how many people lost their deposits? Yeah, I definitely would like to know that. I think yep. that's information that we would like. And, and how many rogue fires? Uh, that, that's my concern is we're gonna see a number of rogue fires, but at least it'll be clear now that the ones in the sand are all gonna be rogue. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you for your time, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank hey, you, nice Thank you nice very much. Job, then I make a motion. We pass this as written. Uh, Lori, just a minute. Lori, so I'm just asking for an implementation time because both of my chiefs are on vacation this week. So I, we would not be prepared to start handing out fire permit, permits tomorrow. No, indeed. indeed. So I, yes. I need at least a week. I'd prefer to, but we need at least a week to implement. Well, Let's see. Do you want to wait two weeks? What do you think? Well, it's up to the board, but I, I just need to have them both back and make sure they are able to communicate and we have the permit in place and everything. You want to say August 1st? Or I, I can't look at oh. my calendar because it's on my phone and I'm zooming from this thing. And what? If we gave you all next week, Lori, and started it, say, on Sunday the 18th? Sure. And if we, and if we needed an extra few days, then we, we would have to take it. Right. But it's just for clarity, we'll mm -hmm. start 18th. Is that good with you? Yeah, I appreciate that. Okay. I'll second the motion. Okay, and that we agree that this will, that we will revisit this at the end of the summer after um, Columbus Day probably or Indigenous Peoples Day or something like that. 
Or even late second, second week of August, right, or so October, right? Yes. You want to wait till October? Well, I think you need all of September. Yeah. 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 Then we can come up with a new plan or a plan for next year. Let's let's let it run and see how it works. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. We we have a motion. You have a second. Yep. Okay. And Ed. Hi. Pat. Hi. Mike. Hi. Alan. Hi. And Sheila says aye. So we'll go with this until October and then we'll we'll review. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks, guys. Good, good, present good, good presentation. Good job. Good job. All right. I think we're on to other business. Um, can you tell me what we set the mill rate at as, as I was uh, in technical distress at the time? $12.40. Okay, thank you. <laughs> this has been Kenny Bond. <laughs> just, right. for, just for you, Ed. $12.40, just for you. Nine sixty, dollars Ed. Thank you. Uh, I have nothing. Thank you. All right, Pat. Nothing, thank you. Mike? No, nothing. Alan? I'm all set. All right, and I have nothing, and Lori? I have a few things. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. She never had anything when I was chair. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila told me, talk as much as you want now. <laughs> so um, in the audience, I was going to ask Dave Powell to bring up Rick Wakeland. Rick Wakeland is our newest budget board member, and he has been driving around the town looking for your meeting. And so um, due to his due diligence, he has now made it into the virtual world. And he just wanted to introduce himself. Um, and I thought it would be a great opportunity for you to meet him as well. Hopefully Rick wants to introduce himself. I do want to introduce myself. <laughs> I, know, I know some of the board of selectmen and I've lived in Kenny, Kenny Bunkport actually for 16 years and uh, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sort of semi-retired uh, out, of, out of the consulting world and I still work part-time and uh, I ha had a, a lot of background in the in the numbers and the budgeting business and I talked to the moderator about that and and I wanted to to be appointed to that committee and I'm I'm glad that I'm having this chance. Well welcome aboard. Sorry about your trip around town this evening. Well I didn't even realize it was a a, a virtual meeting. I guess I hadn't been paying attention. <laughs> Good to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you. You're my welcome Alan, you're my neighbor. I live up on up, uh, on uh, uh, Old Cape Road. So yeah. You you're right behind me. Yeah, I'm right in the woods. Hey, right in the woods, right. You, you guys have a similar accent, so. <laughs> that's because that's we're so close. That's thing. right. <laughs> that, that's what's hiding out here on Old Cape Road in the woods. That's right. <laughs> well, it's very nice to meet you, Rick. Thank you for making the effort nice to come. You, Thank you. Nice to see you again, Rick. Nice to see you, Sheila. It was nice to see Mitch this weekend. Yeah, and, and 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 the babies. <laughs> oh, and Hunter as well. <laughs> yep, a lot of babies now. Yeah, there are a lot of babies. So, thank you very much. You're welcome. And so, Lori, you have. So next on my list is I just wanted to um, thank everybody for coming out for the ribbon cutting yesterday for the new ball field. Uh, the Public Works crew did a great job on that and uh, did it in partnership with um, the Parks and Rec Department, and they really pulled out all the stops and uh, gave the community a great field. And we also wanted to thank Alan and Wanda Daggett for their donation, which made the final pieces, uh, including the backstop relocation, um, come together. That's not something that we had normally budgeted for. 
And so last night, I understand the softball um, team got a chance to play. And if anybody is interested in our pickup softball league, they can call Kenny Bunkport Rec and show up on Wednesday evening. But thank you very much to everybody. It was a great event. We had a great time last night. We had uh, two full teams and we had about 12 or 13 uh, spectators and we all had a great time. We ate a lot of brownies and a lot of cookies and things of that nature that everybody brought. Uh, yeah, we had a great time. So we have plenty more room for many people who want to play. What time do you slow down and watch us from the street when they went by? Yeah. Uh, what time do you start, Alan? What's that? What time do you start? Six o'clock every Wednesday. Six every Wednesday. And we played around. We played till around seven thirty. In that area, we, we played the inning. And, uh, yeah, we had a great time, didn't we, Ed? Sure did. So, the last thing is, I did put in your packets under item thirteen. This is the new language we got from Maine Municipal Association regarding remote meetings. So, the remote meeting allowance under the governor's emergency orders expires thirty days after her. Uh, emergency order expired, which means that it expires at the end of July. The legislature did approve uh, a new law that would allow municipalities to have public meetings that include remote methods for member participation. And these are uh, by exception. So meaning that um, members could, of the board could not participate because of an emergency or an urgent um, issue or because of an illness or a temporary absence or difficulty traveling. So again, the intent is that board members should always be present except for the special circumstances. If um, the town is going to allow board members to participate remotely, you must have the opportunity for the public to participate remotely e as well, either by telephone or video technology. And it has to be simultaneous reception where people can hear and be heard. And all votes done through remote meetings will have to be done um, roll call. So similar to how you're doing them now. So one of the challenges um, that we are facing is um, in today's world, I think that everybody thinks that so much is uh, very easy to do technologically. Um, however, we are streaming on our cable channel, we're doing Zoom, we are doing it on YouTube, and uh, we're recording, and we are also trying to um, supply captions for people. So there's a lot going on with our very small town crew um, who do uh, amazing things. And so uh, Mike and Dave, our AV crew, have ordered some additional equipment, and I believe if Dave wants to talk about it or Mike at all, we are going to try out this weekend to see how that will work. I just want to be clear that when we're doing this, it is not going to be like national television style level of um, customer service. It will be what we can make happen with the technology we have. And I don't want to limit people's ability to participate um, or to be heard. And so that would include planning boards, zoning board of appeals, planning board. I think some board chairs, um, especially land use boards, are concerned about running public hearings where people are remotely commenting as well as people in person. You know, sometimes it can be challenging to uh, moderate all of that. And so we want to think through all those things. And ultimately, the Board of Selectmen would need to adopt a policy in order to allow this to happen. So if you do not adopt a policy, that means that no remote meetings would be allowed. If you do adopt a policy, we have to specify, and I put in your packet what the sample policy that MMA Legal sent out. Um, so we would just have to reiterate what our policy is and um, when that would take place. But I just want to make sure that we're able to give enough of the ability technologically to make it happen. Dave, do you have any comments?
So I have a question. So if you if you have a selectman that's out of town, but he he or she wants to uh, be part of the meeting, uh, would they be allowed to do that? So if the selectmen adopt a policy that says that, and as long as we're using it in accordance with the statute, and we are providing the public that same opportunity to participate remotely, then yes, they could. Okay, great. That should be adopted in all. So are we looking to going back to in-person meetings? So right now you only have the authority to continue virtual meetings through the end of July unless you adopt a policy right. by the end of July. Yeah, so I was just asking if the, the, if the selectmen want to go back to in-person meetings or how do we, if we did that, how do we ensure safety of both of us and participants, that's all. There are obviously gonna be people who haven't had vaccinations and uh, what do we do, so. I think we probably ought to get a policy, I guess. Yeah, we should. So after we try it out this weekend, you know, we'll work on the draft policy similar to what I've sent you. And, right. and but I just want to be able to see it, feel it, touch it before I tell you that, yes, we can do that. Yep, I agree. Right. Okay. I only Is have 10 more, 10 more updates. No, I'm kidding. That's it. <laughs> That's it. I move Lawrence. Okay. Uh, well, Ed. Aye. Pat. Oh, habits are hard to break. I know. Pat. Aye. Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. Gillis says aye. I move to adjourn. Second. And Ed. Aye. Pat. Aye. Mike. Aye. Alan. Aye. I agree. Thank you, everybody. Thank, uh, thank you. you. Have a good weekend. Hey, oh, good